there, Brighton? This, bear with me. This is going to be very rapid because my talk is usually a 30-minute talk. And so I'm going to speed like Speedy Gonzalez. And, um, and then if, I, if we ran out of time for questions, you can find me uh, later on or tonight, and I'll answer all your questions. Um, nope, that's backward. OK. Um, that, this is all the stuff I do. And these are the uh, icons, the, the, the uh, representations of me that I go by. And you'll understand more about that later. Uh, three points I want to get across from, for you today. First, what is a brand and what is not a brand? Second, how the concept of branding has evolved to what it means to us today. And third, I'm going to share with you my recipe for branding. Hmm? Usually everyone goes like, huh? Um, what do I mean with this? I mean that a brand is not a logo. And a logo is not a brand. Let me show you what I mean. What is this? Nike, Nike right. Um, and this is Nike's mission from their website. And this is Nike's attitude. And this is Nike's logo. But this is Nike's brand. Let me give you another example. Well, we, we all know right here. In, in other countries, they're like, hmm. but we all know that this is a logo. Hmm? But it's only a logo. This is the brand, OK? So a logo is the representation of a set of intangible values that set a company or a product or an entity apart from the rest. The brand is that set of values, and it's intangible. So you can think of a logo as a two-dimensional representation of a multi-dimensional experience, and that's the brand. But how did we get here? The first practice of branding can be traced back to 50,000 years ago, and it's ownership. Its purpose was to establish what belonged to whom, and I get it stolen. So cave paintings from the Stone Age suggest that early men might have marked cattle with symbols drawn in paint or tar. All properties considered precious were branded with the markings of the owner. By 2000 BC, <clears throat> excuse me, owners switched to a more permanent method that was burning. Egyptian funeral documents and monuments, almost 5,000 years old, depict branded cattle. In fact, the term branding comes from the Old Norse term brander, which means to burn. The next need solved by branding was to establish a product's origin along with transferring information as to who, where, or with which material goods were made. This practice was worldwide spread. Engravings were found on goods from China, India, Rome, and Mesopotamia. Some of the earliest known marked Chinese pottery dates back more than 5,000 years. In the late Middle Ages, guilds began using marks to distinguish their products and property. Paper makers and printing houses use watermarks. And stonemasons and quarries developed an elaborate system of signs to identify their work and their product. In the Renaissance, artists like Michelangelo began actually signing their names to their work rather than use symbols. And this introduced a new type of branding, authorship, and the notion of brand as a reputation. Fast forward to the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution. Mass production of parity products implied the need to be distinguished and recognized. The first attempt at distinction was through the crates used to transport the goods, which were again hot, iron branded. And soon they were followed by product containers. In fact, the early 1900s marked the birth of packaging design and also the beginning of the modern concept of branding. And by the way, some look better than they do today, but that's just a little insight. 
So by this time, companies had invested so much in branding that they demanded a way to protect those investments from competitors. The Trademarks Registration Act in 1875 provided that protection legally. It also made a brand a company asset, which could be sold or transferred. With so many new brands entering the market and so many parity products, companies needed to differentiate and try to outsell the competition. And that's what advertising comes in. The first budgets were spent on newspaper ads and radio spots. The first TV commercial aired in 1942. By 1952, television ad revenue surpassed magazine and radio spending, and radio spending combined. In the 1950s, the product is the core differential, so advertising communicates its existence. But by the 60s, the need to, for further differentiation emerges. So putting a logo on a product and saying it exists is no longer enough. The messaging becomes emotional in an effort to give a product a personality. In the 70s, with TV sets now common, the formula for winning is clear. A good commercial and massive spending. Consumers become very brand conscious and brands become status symbols. In the 80s and 90s, companies begin to cultivate their company brand rather than their product brand, focusing on corporate identity, vision, and values. The company behind the brand becomes the focus. By the end of the 1990s, internet is widely available, at least in Western countries. In little over two decades, our entire way of communicating and interacting has completely changed. In terms of branding, this has had two major implications. The first is there is nowhere to, to hide. The world is watching and recording, and news is instantaneous. Brands nets need to be constantly alert. But most important, we are all brands now. And we must be aware and careful in building and managing our brands, regardless of there being large companies or small personal brands. So branding has evolved from establishing ownership to certify origin, quality, and authorship, to distinguish one product from the other, to differentiate parity products, to turning a brand into a company asset, to imply status, and to represent reputation. Today, your brand is your kept promise to your customer. Or to say it with Jeff Bezos, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So this looks awesome, right? But it looks challenging and expensive. What about us? Should we build or manage our personal business brand? And the answer, of course, is yes, we have to. So how can we do it? I'll be super rapid. One, know yourself and know your product service. Two, know your customer and how you can make his life better. N Know your market and find your niche in that market. Know the others and what makes you different, special, better. Others are, are the, your, compet your competitors. Have or get a clear vision. That's where you're heading. Values, have them and stand by them. Be genuine and honest and remember, the world's watching. Be strategic, have a plan, know what you're doing and where you're going at all times. Give your brand an appropriate personality. And it's only now that we think and talk about logo and visual branding. Everything else is more important and before and comes before. Don't skimp, it's your face. Work hard. Stay consistent, check often, 
And being mindful is not mandatory, but I do always suggest that you stay aware of where you are and what surrounds you so that you can modulate your communication. And if your brand is a personal brand, steps one through seven apply just the same, rules nine through 11 apply just the same, but you are <laughs> your brand and it should have your personality. Opportunely curbed, but it should be you, it's you. So to wrap it up, a brand is an organic, living, breathing being. One that needs care and nurturing to grow and prosper. Give it your best, love it, foster it, care for it. And when you step on a poo, because you're going to, we all do, we're human. Own it, apologize, fix it as best as you can, and learn from it. Thank you. And that's me, if you want to get in touch.